Alright, here we go again. Snow days means uh, BC calculus videos. We're going to do exponential growth and decay, which actually doesn't have a whole lot of calculus in it. just has the calculus behind the equations, and then if you can recognize the setup, you don't have to actually do too much calculus at all. It just has a bunch of algebra 2. Um, you're going to hear my family in the background because I'm tired of shutting myself up in the office to do these. So, excuse the bursts of, um, of energy from various and sundry children that are around. See? Dylan, the nine-year-old, has his friend Max over. Delaney and Devin and Deanna are all home. So, along with, of course, Mr. Getz. So, anyway, that could be some of the noise you hear. Here's the warm-up. This would have been a handout that I gave to you. Let's get the camera situated. Some of you told me that the bottom of the screen got cut off last time, so I'm going to try to make sure that I overcompensate. But I hope that's okay, although now it looks like the top of the screen. Maybe like that? We'll see. All right, there's also your homework. If you notice, page 357 to 339. Ah, that can't possibly be 339. 357, that must have been the old page. 357 through 359 is what that should say up there. 359. Ah. 11 to 19 odd, 24, 26, 27, and 31. All right, so this is old information. Solve the, differen solve the differential equation below with the initial condition that y equals 0 and y when x equals 1. So I've given you a separable differential equation that can be solved algebraically. And then I've given you the slope field uh, that, ge that, um, that was generated using this differential equation. So if I solve this, by separating so that I get, I'm going to move up here, so I multiply both sides by y, so I get y dy dx is equal to x, and then I integrate both sides with respect to x B, by, and I get y squared over 2, and x squared over 2, and then plus c. I can either multiply by th through by 2 now or later um, using my initial condition of 1, 0. So that would be right here. I'm going to plug in, when I plug in 0 for y and for x, I hope you see that c is equal to negative 1 half. So if I leave the 1 halves at first, I get 1 half y squared is equal to 1 half x squared minus 1 half for y squared is equal to x squared minus 1. And of course, if you can imagine putting the x squared over here, it would be negative x squared plus y squared is equal to negative 1, or negative x squared plus y squared plus 1 is equal to 0, which is a hyperbola, which I hope you can see here. If you kind of follow the slope field from 1 comma 0, I'm going to slide up this way and slide down this way. All oh, rats. Now that is one branch of the hyperbola, and you can see the other branch is over here, but as I was talking about in class, when you have discontinuities, this initial condition here, ah, I have a thing on the pen that makes it advance when I don't want it to, a button on the pen, I keep hitting. Um, this initial condition here doesn't guarantee that I have the exact match other branch of the hyperbola across. There's no guarantee that this initial condition means that I have this branch as well. So just be careful with discontinuities. If I change the initial condition, I can change what branch I have. Hmm. 
why is that not working? Erase. Ah, there we go. So, there if I was asked to sketch the solution through the initial condition 1 comma 0, that's what I would draw. If you get out your calculator, if you have your calculator with you, and you run your program, a uh, slope field, and I used, I put in for, I put my window negative 4 to 4 and negative 4 to 4 here, and put uh, x divided by y into y1, ran the slope field, and I saw this picture. If then you go to y2, like we, again, like we did in class, and you put into y2, if I get y by itself here, I get y is equal to plus or minus the square root of x squared minus 1. If you put the positive square root of x squared minus 1 into y2 and negative square root of x minus 1 into uh, y3, you'll see this hyperbola. Although, you, and you will see the whole thing. You will see this one as well. You will see this branch. Let me see. Let me show that. Hi, Mr. Getz. Hello. Now, I don't have the slope field program on here, but I can show you square root of x squared minus 1. And the square root, the negative square root. Minus one. Then I'm going to change my window just to match what I see on my screen. Negative four to four. And negative four to four. And I'm going to go ahead and make these thick lines like I taught you to do. It just makes it easier. Again, I'm not going to have the slope field on my graph. So there you go. Now, if I had changed my initial condition to, let's say, just switch it around. x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 0, I would have ended up with this. I would have ended up with a positive one over here. And now look at the hyperbola that I get. Crazy, right? But do you see that that goes through the point 0 comma 1? So, slope fields, we're done. Now, that's, slope fields are going to come back when we do, um, not today's lesson with exponential growth and decay, although I could use it, but with logistic growth, the next lesson that we do, we're going to see, because some of the logistic growth equations can be kind of nasty, um, and we might use slope fields to show the solution. All right, don't, again, don't forget again that this is really 359, not 339. Population, bighorn sheep. I wish I had a picture of a bighorn sheep. And a population increases at a rate that is proportional to the number of sheep present, at least for a while. We're not going to, I'm just using this as a, an example of what you might see in a book. Um, population of living creatures in general can be modeled with exponential growth. We have things that decrease at an exponential 
rate. And what that means is that your rate is proportional to the amount present. Uh, if you're doing physics or chemistry, you've dealt with radioactive. Then you time you deal with uh, economics, your money and an interest bearing account. If you had me from Algebra 2 or probably any Algebra 2, you did compound interest and stuff like that. This is what the differential equation looks like to represent the rate of change. Notice this, rate of change, rate of change. How does y change with respect to time is proportional, there's your constant proportionality, to the original amount. So this is y, this is your equation y, the rate of change of y with respect to time is proportional, so a multiplier, times the original amount. That's what it means to have exponential growth or decay. So if that's a, if that's a differential equation, I should be able to, it's separable, so I can solve it um, with integration, and I can get the actual equation for y. So divide both sides by y. Remember, k is a constant. So now I'm going to integrate. Well, naturally, here comes ln, which means, of course, e is going to come out because I'm going to try to get that y by itself. I didn't do anything. I just shifted this slide up e to the both sides. I've got that kind of gross absolute value there. I use the law of, from Algebra 2 right here. Ah. Turn that into e to the c, but remember e to a constant is still just another constant. Again, I just shifted everything up. I undid the absolute value with the piecewise plus minus right here. But plus or minus a constant is still just a constant. And sometimes we will call that constant in these scenarios an exponential growth and decay A. Remember, this is zero, and zero means initial condition. So at the beginning of time, when I'm usually measuring exponential growth or decay, at time zero, y is the initial amount that I have. So I'm going to replace y with y sub zero at time zero. And look what happens, right? Because e to the zero is just one. So your initial condition is a. This is the solution. y is equal to y sub 0 times e to the kt. I call this yect. I don't know why, right? Yect. But it just that's what it looks like to me. When I think solving a differential equation of the form ky, remember this started with the differential equation dy dt the rate of change of y with respect to time is a constant proportionality times the original amount of y that you have. This solution with an initial condition of at time equals zero, you have an initial amount, looks like this. And remember, sometimes they use a, sometimes they use c, sometimes they use whatever for your initial condition amount. To me, that's yet. Exponential change then, y is equal to your initial amount times e to some constant proportionality, k, times the amount of time. If the constant k is positive, we're talking about growth. If k is negative, then the equation represents decay. So again, the problems for homework are mostly going to involve using this exponential change equation. 
right? Which means the calculus of solving dy dt is equal to uh, ky is done. You don't have to do that over and over again as long as you recognize in the words that you're talking about exponential growth or exponential decay. And that's what this is said. You don't need, AP does not need you to keep solving that same equation over and over again. They want you to recognize it. So to find the amount at any given time, I have to know the initial amount, and I have to know the constant proportionality, or my k, and how much time has passed. You'll see this in continuously compounded interest problems. And some of the earlier problems that you have, you actually, in your homework, you have a chart to fill out where it gives you and changes the initial amount, how much time has passed, and what else do they change? They give you the annual rate, the doubling time, the amount in 30 years, blah, blah, blah. This really is yet. If you do it continuously, compounding interest continuously, you take the limit, <coughs> excuse me, of the compound interest formula, and you get yet. Again, if you had me for Algebra 2, we called this PERT. Oh, rats, Delaney's going to practice her piano. This is beautiful, Delaney. No, you guys can hear me through the piano playing, right? <laughs> so PERT, if you remember, uh, this is how I didn't tell you where this came from. This came from a differential equation and when you were in Algebra 2. So I have an example um, that I'm going to go through with you uh, that involves a skater. But before I do this example, I want to show you some other formulas you're going to run across in the book when you're doing your homework. I already said that radioactive decay is yet, but with a negative, right? So that way I can always call k a positive number. That's all that, the only reason to change the formula that way. Half-life is a term that you're going to see in some of your homework problems. And again, you can skip some math if you calculate half-life the first time. If I take, well, what's, the, what's half of my initial amount? See right here? Half the initial amount. What is the time that it takes for an original amount to decay so that I only have half of it left? And again, I'm just doing this in the abstract. I divided both sides by the initial amount. Now I'm doing some Algebra 2. I want, I want time. So I'm going to get use natural logs to get it down out of exponential land. Use some properties of logs there which I don't really have to do if I have my calculator, ln1 minus ln2, but this is going to show you a formula. We know that ln1 is equal to 0, so ln2 is equal to kt. So the time it takes to decay an, an initial amount so that only half of the material is left is always going to be ln2 over your constant proportionality. Mr. Getz tells me that he just hands this formula to kids in physics. Right, Mr. Getz? Yes. Ln k over Ln two over k, right? I probably review it. He probably reviews it. He says, "Yeah, right." They don't do any math and physics. They just hand you a bunch of formulas. Wah, wah. Um. <laughs> anyway, so you can always, if you forget this formula, of course, on the hello, it wasn't that big of a deal to figure out what it was. But AP, if you have a half-life question which is most often going to be multiple choice things, not, not uh, free response. Um, you can just use the formula without deriving it. Another application of differential equations is Newton's law of cooling. So if I have, and you have a, I think it's actually coffee, 
cup problem that I might do with you if I have some time in your homework. Um, so the only difference between this, this is really just still yet, but you have to take into an account the air temperature surrounding. So this says the rate of change of the temperature, the rate of change of temperature with respect to time is negative K times the temperature minus T sub S. I don't know why they use S, but that's basically your um, surrounding medium, you know, like room temperature, if you want to think about it. It's a constant, though. And if you do the differential equations on this, again, yeah, this is really y is equal to y sub 0 e to the negative kt. If we give you these problems on a test, if I need you to use Newton's law of cooling or if AP does, they will give you the formulas. So don't worry about that. But you, for homework, you're going to have to plug into this equation. All right, so that's the end of the slides. So I want to go to this example. Let's do more examples. Actually, I don't know why I went back to that slide, because I <laughs> have the worksheet here. sign in again. Don't look at my... I'm just kidding. I know you can't see it. Alright, so if you go to... This worksheet will be um, visible. So if you go to Solutions, Unit 7, I will make this worksheet visible. So notice I gave you a little bit of notes here. Assuming that other forces being absent, absent, the resistance encountered by a moving object, such as a car coasting to a stop, is proportional to the object's velocity. So the only difference here in this problem is that... Um, I've given you this extra M for the mass, that's all. So I wanted to show you an example of that. So if my initial velocity at t equals zero, I'm asking you to solve the differential equation. So this is just a way for them to make you, instead of jumping right from dy over dt is equal to ky right to yect, they added this little M here, trying to see if you can get the equation involved with it. So, since mass is a constant, though, this was really not a big deal. The rate of change of velocity with respect to time is equal to negative K over M. And again, I used the negative here. They gave me the negative because it's going to be a decay issue. Anti-differentiate of both sides. The M, again, is a constant, so it doesn't worry me. Natural log of the absolute value of V is equal to negative KT over that M plus C. V is equal to E to the, again, this is really a plus or minus issue, but a plus or minus constant is still a constant. So the initial, solve, initial velocity is equal to C E to the zero, which means V to the zero is equal to C. And there, right here, is my equation then. So, if they give me a 50 kilogram ice skater, which is my mass, and they give me a velocity, they give me an initial v sub zero when she begins coasting. Now, can you imagine coasting, right? You're 
I'm skating, 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 so my feet are moving, and then I stop and I skate across the ice because of the resistance, and my speed is 6.66 meters per second, so another velocity after one second, find the value of proportionality. So using this equation here, I'm going to plug in my velocity after time has passed, 6.66, is equal to my initial velocity of 7, e to the negative k over 50, there's my mass, that's a constant, times 1 second. And then I'm just doing algebra 2, notice no calculus here. Plugging and chugging, divide by 7, ln, divide by, I'm sorry, multiply by negative 50, and I get k. Now when I get this k, I'm storing it. That was beautiful, Lane. So I'm typing in negative 50 ln store because I'm going to use this for later answers I'm going to store this in alpha okay okay because as I move down here now notice when I write it if I had to write it out I rounded it or truncated it to three places past the decimal our book doesn't do that it annoys me our solutions uh, for the back of the book they don't round to three places past the decimal and it says it's supposed to be AP style Psi. All right, so this says, how long will it take the skater to coast from 7 meters to second to 1 meters per second? Notice again that the units they're giving me are velocity units. So I'm going to go to the velocity equation here. Don't forget my initial velocity was 7. I'm plugging in 1. Yep. Here's my initial, 7, e to the negative k times t. Now remember this k I have stored in my calculator. So I'm plugging and chugging some algebra here. ln 1 over 7 is equal to negative k over 50t. Multiply both sides by negative 50 over k to get t by itself. But when I do this on my calculator, I'm actually doing... negative 50 divided by alpha k times ln 1 divided by 7, which of course is ln 1 minus ln 7, and ln 1 is 0, so you could also type negative ln 7. Your calculator does not care. So 39.081 or 39.082 seconds, either one of those AP would take because you can either truncate or round. Now here's the interesting question. How far, and this is, I think you're going to get one like this for your homework if I'm not mistaken. How far would the skater coast before coming to a complete stop? Some kids will leave this blank because they don't even understand really what it's asking. But the first thing you need to recognize is it says how far, which is a distance question. How far is distance? I don't have a distance equation. I have a velocity equation. But since I have distance, I'm sorry, since I have velocity and I want distance, I just have to integrate velocity. So I integrated my velocity equation. I showed my u substitution steps here u is equal to negative k, again a constant, over 50 t, and I really know what k is already. I used my u substitution and differentiated my u to get negative k over 50 dt. Went here, floated it osmosis that constant out, 7 e to the u du, right, 7 times negative 50, that is where the negative 350 came in, e to the u, plus c. And again, remember, I know what this k is. This is my initial distance. s sub 0 is 0. So now I have 
Here is my distance equation with c is equal to 0. I'm sorry, where I'm going to plug in. So I get 0 is equal to negative 350k e to the 0 plus c. So I solve for c, and I get 350 over k. And again, I could have written what this, you know, what this 350 divided by my k was, but it was just easier to do it like this for me. So here is my distance equation. So I have a distance equation here, which allows me now to think about how far anything happens. So if they gave me a time, I could tell them what, how far I've gone from my initial distance of zero. But they didn't give me a time. They said, how far will the skater coast before coming to a complete stop? I have to understand that coasting then means I'm basically talking about as t goes to infinity on the ice, right? So I take a limit. Who saw that coming? The limit as t goes to infinity of the distance equation. Well, I don't care how ugly this negative 350 over k is. It is just a constant. It is multiplying e to the negative whatever, which in from algebra 2, I know, my I know my e function very well, and I know this is going to go to 0. Right? Think of that as negative 3 e to the negative 2t, or you know, whatever you want. That my exponential function of this form is going to go to 0 as x or t goes to infinity. So the limit then, as I go to infinity, of this piece goes to zero, which leaves me just with this number. So my limit is 350 over k, which is about, using my calculator, 150.589. Notice my units, meters. Because when I integrate it back here, you're integrating velocity, which is in meters per second, times time units, which are seconds, cancel out, and gives me meters. And notice down here I say that I am using k stored in my calculator. Right, 350 divided by alpha k gave me this number. All right. So again, this is not, I will, as soon as I'm done with this, I will make this available, this worksheet available um, in the math group solutions. But before I let you go, I do want to do um, a couple of these homework problems with you. So I'm just going to get myself a blank screen here. And I think I chose to do one problem. Number 26 and number 31. So number 26 was oh, a ha involving a half-life problem. So this was, again, on page 357. 357. Number 26. So it says blah, 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 polonium 210. What the heck is polonium, Mr. Getz? It's an element. <laughs> Thanks for that illuminating answer. Polonium 210. What yeah. does 210 mean? Oh my god. <laughs> I love what math teachers do say. <laughs> He's the worst. Well, right before then is radion 222. Yeah. Wow. They're both radioactive. Oh! Polonium. Radioactive! Radioactive! <laughs> Who sings that song? That's there's the. Oh, Imagine Dragons! Yeah. I'm pretty That'd hip. Correct. I'm pretty hip. So hip. <laughs> Anywho. Polonium okay. is named after Poland, by the way. It is not. Oh, you can't make me fall for that. That's where Marie Curie is from. How you doing, Delaney? Really? Polonium is named after Poland? Yes. I think he's lying. <laughs> look it up. All right, I'll look it up. I don't know. I never yeah. know when to believe he's him. Interweb. Mm, wah, wah. All right, the number of, oh, it does say it's radioactive. The number of radioactive atoms remaining after T days in a sample of polonium-210 that starts with Y sub zero radioactive at atoms is, and they give me K. So this is nice. If you see in your book, they tell me that Y is equal, this is my yect, Y sub zero 
e to the negative 0.005t. So that means that k is negative, oops, sorry. Remember, because it's decay, the negative is part of the formula, and that lets me call my constant proportionality a positive number. So, and part A says find the half-life. Well, hello, if you remember half-life formula, <laughs> why did I write a half and then a half, I don't, and then the word half? <laughs> half-life is ln2 over k. which is um, 138.629 days. If you don't remember this formula, all you have to do is plug in, well, I guess, did they give me the initial amount? No, they just said y sub 0. I can, again, use my, say, oh, 1 half of y sub 0, Right, I showed you this in the sub. One half of what I was left. Blah, blah. There you go, but remember the negatives are going to cancel out because that's ln1 minus ln2 over negative 0.005, but that's 0, so I have negative ln2 over negative 0.005, buh, bye, and there's my ln2 over 0.005. Alright, so there's part A. Part B says, uh, your sample will be useful, will not be useful to you after 95% of the radioactive nuclei present on the day that the sample arrives have disintegrated. For about how many days? Bing, bing, bing. For about how many days? So I'm solving for T. After the sample arrives, will you be able to use the polonium? So rather than me writing this part out, here is 26b. Notice that the really the, the math is pretty much the same. I just have to know that I'm plugging in 0 0.05 because when it said after 95% of the radioactive material is present, so that means that I have my 5% left. So that's why 0 0.05 is there. Okay? Now I'm going to go back and do, I do want to show you work, my work, for Newton. This is the book, you'll see the book solutions too, but I want to step you through this one. So this is number 31. Oh, it's soup, not coffee. Uh, suppose that the cup of soup cooled from 90 degrees to 60 degrees in 10 minutes whose room temperature was 20. Use Newton's law of cooling. So again, if I was to say this to you on a test, I would give you Newton's law of cooling formula. You would not have to derive it yourself. I'm not going to give you yet. right? you see, you got to have to recognize dy equals dt, that, that's, that the solution to that differ, uh, differential equation is yet. I'm not going to give you that, but I will give you Newton's. So my initial or constant room temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. What do we need? Freaking Europe? Why are they using Celsius? Celsius. The it's science. <laughs> <laughs> so room temp is, is 20 degrees Celsius about what? 70? Yeah. Okay. Who knew? Hey, don't be hating. 
I grew up in, I was, I took science in elementary and middle school when we, when they were, nobody understood in PG County. We did not before do the metric. Celsius. Yeah, before <laughs> Celsius was invented. Where are you going with that? Not before Celsius was invented, before we ever recognized, before they ever recognized, it was like un-American to do metric. Right. Other countries. Yes, it was like, oh, it's so terrible. Anyway. Uh... All right, so that's my initials. So the formula, Newton's law of cooling formula, is it, it is just yet, as I showed you before, and it is a decay because I am cooling down. So they gave me sixty was the temperature I got to minus my initial or my room temperature of twenty started at 90 minus again my room temperature of 20 and I have to remember that that it already cooled to 60 degrees in 10 minutes they want to know how much longer it would take the soup to get to 35 so 60 so oops Again, Algebra 2, no calculus, right, that's 40 over 70, but the zeros cancel out. Naturally, here comes the natural log. Oops, I forgot to put in 10 here. And this I'm just putting into my calculator. And I got 0 0.05. Another 5 or just my 9? Let's see. Can't read my own writing. That was stupid. 559, five, okay. Store that in alpha K. So my K, which who really cares how many decimal places I write down right now because this is not my final answer. But when I got my K, I then had to say, well, what about when I'm to 35 degrees? So I had to go back and say, okay, now I'm interested in 35 degrees. And again, I start to see a pattern. It's always going to be LN of this thing.
And remember, I've stored this into my calculator. And so I type ln 15 over 70 divided by negative um, alpha k, and I get 27.526 minutes. But remember, 10 minutes had already happened of cooling. They want to know how many, how much longer. This would be a mean multiple choice question if 27.526 was there and so was 17.526. I hope they wouldn't do that to you. Because they asked, again, the wording of the question said, how much longer would it take the soup to cool to 35 degrees Celsius? That's only part A. So part B says, instead of being left to stand in the room, a cup of 90 degree Celsius soup is put into a freezer whose temperature is nine, negative 15 degrees. The only thing that's going to change is instead of notice that part A, I was manipulate, I had to change my 35, all part B is going to do is manipulate this, T sub S. I already know K. Still wondering about getting to 35, but my initial room temperature is now the freezer, which is negative 15. Still started at 90. So the only thing this is going to change is that I'm gonna blah 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 end up with ln of 50 over 1m5 divided by negative k is gonna give me t again k is stored in your calculator and I get 13.258 minutes All right, so you really don't have that many other uh, problems now that I've done 26 and 31 with you. Um, like I said some of the other problems involve money and compound interest. And I give you a cool problem. Number 27 is kind of cool reading initial conditions kind of from a graph. Hint, hint. All right, have fun. Enjoy the day off, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.